Hello, I'm Simon Rogan. I'm in my Alvis Development Kitchen in Cartnell, and I'm really excited to be part of the British Cheese Weekender this year. At all our restaurants in the Lake District, we work with Cartnell cheeses and promote British cheese in our dishes, our cheese trolleys, and our boards. One of my favourites is Westcombe Cheddar, and that is what I'll be using today, showing you how to create Westcombe Cheese Dumplings, one of our signature dishes. I hope you enjoy these as much as I do, and it will feed four. So, the title of the dish, broth of onions, Westcombe cheese, and fragrant thyme oil. To make the dish, first make the onion stock the day before by caramelizing 1.25 kilos of sliced onions in some sunflower oil. When nice and golden, pour in the water and cook on a very low heat for 30 minutes. Leave to cool and then place in the fridge overnight for the onions to infuse into the water. Also the day before, make the thyme oil by heating 100 mils of sunflower oil to 86 degrees and then add 25 grams of thyme. The next morning, pass the onion stock through a sieve, making sure you extract all that lovely stock and also pass the thyme oil. Next, make the dashi stock by bringing to the boil 500 mils of water, 6 grams of dry seps and 10 grams of kombu. Simmer on a very low heat for 30 minutes, then pass through a sieve into a clean pan. Bring the liquid back to 80 degrees, add the bonito flakes, then stir for 15 seconds and pass once more. Now to make the Western cheese water that will form the basis of our dumplings. Place the cheese in a pan with 500 mils of water. Heat up slowly for a few hours to melt the cheese so it can fuse into that water. When ready, pass and chill in the fridge. And once chilled, remove any fat from the surface. Finally, to make the dumplings, mix the 400 grams of cheese water with the 38 grams of kuzu in a pan with a little salt. Heat up gently, whisking as the mixture starts to thicken. Then transfer to a piping bag and pipe into moulds that have been sprayed with silicon spray and allowed to set fully in the fridge. So now to plate. Heat up the dumplings gently in some butter emulsion and then when ready, place into a bowl. Heat up the onion broth and season with your dashi stock to taste. Pour over the dumplings, drizzle in the thyme oil and finish with some thyme leaves. And there you have it. I hope you enjoy it. What a brilliant video from Simon Rogan. Fantastic that he's agreed to take part in the British Cheese Weekend. The amazing recipe for Westcombe dumpling. Westcombe cheddar is one of our great cheeses. Um, so brilliant that he's been involved and, and you can see the passion for cheese from Simon. Someone else with a lot of passion for cheese is uh, Kaylee Thorogood, who is um, the restaurant manager at uh, Rogan & Co. Previously worked at uh, Long Clume, uh, Simon's uh, uh, two Michelin star restaurant. Both restaurants are in Cumbria. Is that right? Whereabouts exactly, Kaylee, are you in the country? So we are based in Cartmel, which is, yeah, in the in the Lake District, um, just at the South Lakes. I'm actually in Rogan & Co at the moment. We're getting ready for reopening, planning our menus and so on. So it's uh, quite a busy time for us right now. Well, it's brilliant that you, and we can speak to you because Really, you are, I mean, I don't want to be rude, Kelly, but you are a massive cheese geek, aren't you? Is that fair to say? I think that would be a, <laughs> a fair and polite way um, to talk about my, my love for cheese. Yeah, definitely. So when, when we were organising the British Cheese Weekend, I thought it'd be great if we could get someone like Simon Rogan, who I know does a lot for British cheese involved. And I follow Kaylee on, on Instagram and I, I, I've i seen the, the lengths she goes to to get the <laughs> cheese. And I thought, well, I'll just drop her a message and see. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for taking part yourself and, and to Simon and everyone at, at, at Rogan. It's, it's great to have you on board. Um, and it's, it's, it's really good, actually, because I'm always intrigued about how restaurants put together their their cheese boards. And, and that's kind of you know a big part of your job isn't it um yeah absolutely. So we've, we've got we're going to go through that today and sort of talk about how you put together an amazing cheese board and we've picked i've got my carefully uh curated cheese board so kaylee and i agree yeah. the cheeses look there we go Whoop, don't drop my pickled walnuts uh we've got, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll go through the cheeses one by one but before we we tuck in kaylee so tell us a bit about you know 
the Rogan Empire, the different restaurants and, and how you do the cheeses differently in each? So we've got three restaurants in the Lake District now. So we've obviously got um, Long Plume and Rogan and Co in Cartmel, which are maybe a three minute walking distance from each other. And then back in the back end of 2019, we opened Henrock, which is a little bit different for us. So Henrock's inside a hotel in Bowness, and it works with um, flavors from throughout the world as opposed to the restaurants in Cumbria, which mainly um, work with ingredients from our farm, which is just a mile and a half away from the restaurants here, and also all British produce. Um, hence why we obviously use all British cheeses in both of the restaurants and quite heavily <laughs> as well, I would say. Um, where, do you, where, do you, where do you get your cheese from? Do you work with a particular maker or a monger? How does that work? So we work with Cartmel Cheeses, uh, which is great because we can pop just around the corner and go and see them if, if we need something halfway through service, which doesn't happen too often, but of course can happen. Um, and we've had a really close relationship with them for quite a few years now. Um, so yeah, Ian at Cartmel Cheeses is our main supplier for, um, for all of those. We work a little bit with um, Hampshire Cheese Company directly because Simon, if anyone's ever seen Simon's cookbook, he's a huge fan of Tunworth, um, Tunworth cheese, and it's been used in quite a lot of recipes that we've done in the restaurants. Yeah, no, that's yeah. Is there a Tunworth ice cream? Is that right? There is. It's actually my favourite food that I've ever consumed. Is the uh, <laughs> is the Tunworth ice cream? I'm it's, just trying to imagine what that must taste like. Sort of cold, but then you get all the kind of earthy mushroomy notes the the, the that, that's the camembert flavor coming through as well it's really confusing to eat yeah. it's a it's a dish that you really have to think about while in while enjoying it yeah it's, um, I mean it's just sort of an um, yeah I can imagine it, it just on the palate when you sort of it's an ice cream but it's cheese it must be sort of just mess with your senses a little bit um I'm interested. We uh, before we came on, we were talking a little bit about the uh, long clune that, well, for a long time you've done a, a cheese trolley, so a really big selection of cheese. That that's changed a little bit with, with the COVID situation and going to cheese boards. You were saying, yeah, absolutely. So um, it's always been a cheese trolley at Long Clume, and I think when they first started doing it, it was maybe around twenty three cheeses. Oh, and wow. when I started, we we refined that um, down a little bit. Simon wanted to stick to having fewer cheeses, um, but really highlight the great cheeses that we had on there. So he was doing 11 just before we closed back in March last year. And then when we reopened in July, it was just, it was a little bit tricky. We do a lot of obviously table side interaction already. So putting in another element, we, um, we thought it was probably safer to do a board so we stuck to doing a four cheese board um there which was uh, still incredible but we're will hoping the trolley, will the trolley come back will you be wheeling out the trolley again at some point fingers crossed um <laughs> fingers crossed yeah we're hoping that when we go back we can we can get back to normal and the trolley will be back in use um one of the conditions of me coming to rogan and co was was that I could go back and do the first cheese trolley when it returned. <laughs> so you, if anyone sees me running through the village, um, that's what's happening. And you'll be doing it on roller skates, obviously. Cheese trolley uh, on roller skates around the restaurant. Yeah. I can see it now. It's I, a I great mean, idea. I'm, I'm always, always intrigued by the cheese trolley because it must be hard to keep so many cheeses in, in, well, firstly, in good condition and secondly, choosing the range as well. Like what... You know what what do you go for when you've got like yeah. 11 cheese i mean that is a hell of a cheese board isn't it what what do you try and do with that do you different so, styles different producers yeah so we would mainly try and do um four different as we would call it sections when teaching someone how to do the um the cheese trolley and this is a huge thing that i actually learn mainly from andy at the courtyard dairy who first taught me how to um, look after and care for a cheese trolley. So we would basically split them up into um, soft lactic cheeses, which are obviously usually your, um, your goat's cheeses. 
uh, as well as St Jude would probably fit into that um, category as well. Yeah. And then we'd move on to wash rind cheeses, so maybe made of ale and St James and Risley and so on. And then we would do hard cheeses and then we'd finish with blue cheeses. And that would usually be the order that we'd suggest the guests enjoy them in the restaurant as well, so that the no cheese is sort of affecting the, the next flavour. So you do, would you leave the washed rind cheeses towards the end? No, because they're quite powerful, aren't they? Yeah, it, dep it, it would depend on the style of washed rind. Made of ale is quite, um, quite strong, but if you get a really punchy cheddar, we'd probably um, keep the cheddar till after that. So oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's, I, I would do it. I mean, that, that, I, can, I know some of those soft washed rind cheeses actually are quite, although they can be quite pungent on the nose they're quite mild when you taste them weirdly aren't they because they, they, they have yeah. a buttery paste a lot i suppose depends as well on the time of the year and how the cheese is being affected by that and the, and the milk and so on but that's the four sections usually and you and you, and you offer the customer and cut you know that they say i want this, this 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 i mean how many can they just try everything or do you say <laughs> try four or five or what do you recommend so it's normally five cheeses and they um, get to choose that we do. yeah and they get to choose them all and some people are really like oh i really want to know the story about every single cheese and some people are like oh just choose for me yeah. and both of those are great what we always try and do and um uh, what I've always tried to do and learn in the trolley is not just learn about the flavor profiles of the cheese. The main thing has always been the people that make them. Um, and that's why I think doing a British cheese trolley really allows you to engage in into that. And uh, uh, for us, we'd be really interested in all of the technical ways that the cheese has been made. But for yeah. most of our guests, they just want to know about the lovely children that the um that the makers have and, <laughs> and where they're based and how long they've been farming for and why they decided to make cheese in the first place and um, so the stories are just as important to us when yeah, it's, that human, it's that human connection actually this cheese is made by a family business if it's Kirkham's Lancashire you know it's second exactly. generation Mrs Kirkham and now Graham Kirk you know people love that don't they I'm aware, Kaylee, we've been talking for at least eight or nine minutes. We've not eaten any cheese. Yeah. I think wrong. And I think we should we should we should rectify that now. So we've well, you've chosen three cheeses. Um, and do you want to well which are the three and which order are we going to eat them in? Um, so I would start with Baron Bygod, um, which okay. actually it's funny, we were having this conversation the other day, and I was saying I've never actually, um, it's very rare that I ever have a board without Baron Bygod. Oh, really? So it's are one we, that I took Are time. we in favourite cheese territory here, Kaylee? Would you say this is one of your faves? Yeah, this is, a, this is where the conversation started. And um, I probably wouldn't necessarily say that if somebody asked me outright. And then I realised that I hardly ever have a board without it. So I'd say it. <laughs> So this is, I mean, this is, I've got a really lovely piece here. I don't know if it's coming yeah. up on the camera, but my, I've still got a little bit of chalk in the middle, but oh my, the goo, the goo underneath the rind is really bulging, which is a good sign. I'm um, trying to scoop mine up because mine is definitely in a very Well, gooey... look, that's, that's a Michelin star bit of cheese there, isn't it? So yours is gooey all the way through, is it? It is, yeah. And um, one thing that I realised, is that guests absolutely love a cheese that's like this yeah. and if it's running away from you it's um it's the best way for them to have it and that that's that's the one that they will always go for if there's a cheese running on the trolley they will always choose it so let's have a taste i mean i love i love this cheese as well um tell us the story of baron Bogger. i mean the flavors are amazing like mushroom and some brassica mm -hmm. notes you know like that sort of vegetal flavor yeah it's it's really really interesting um this one so this is made down at uh, fen farm dairy and 
it's right that it changes in the season. Johan at the moment has still got the um, chalkiness in the centre. Obviously, as it starts to, if the cheese um, is starting to mature, it'll break down all the way to the centre of the cheese, which is what my one um, has done here. It's funny, there's actually a bit of a reason why people, or why British people tend to enjoy a brie like that because obviously originally it was only the French that was uh, producing great traditional three kilogram wheels of, of brie cheese and by the time it had been um, transported over to England it was the perfect amount of time for the cheese to completely break down into this really runny form so naturally for years and years and years we've we've enjoyed a brie like that and when we see it like that we're like oh that's that's, so that's great so the british love their brie's really gooey and mm. that's partly because when we got them from france they were gooey so that's what we've learned that's really interesting i didn't know that that's a really good uh, that's a good fact i mean i quite yeah. like them. i quite like them with a bit of chalk still i like me too them, and i like a little bit of chalk still in the middle just to give you that contrast in texture and, and the chalky centre tends to be a bit more sort of acidic, doesn't it? A bit, sh a little bit more sort of lactic and sharp. Um, exactly, yeah. And the breakdown, you know, which is the you know, technical term for the gooey bit, is where you get all these lovely uh, sort of flavour uh, compounds kind of being released. And this one for me, I mean, we're tasting, you know, I'm in Brighton, you're in Cumbria. So, you know, we've got perhaps different batches of cheese, but... Um, Mine's got real, like, it's almost like cauliflower flavour, like that sort of, it's almost like cauliflower cheese. It, it yeah. Rich and creamy, but then with um, definite brassica, because sometimes they can be quite a bit cabbagey, Brussels sprouts, um, a bit wild mushroom. and But this one's definitely mushroom and, and perhaps a bit of cauliflower for me. Um, I mean, it's, it's outrageous stuff, really, isn't it? It is so <laughs> delicious. Um, and it, what makes this quite special, Kelly, is it's raw milk, isn't it? Which there aren't many raw milk brees in, made in Britain. No, absolutely, absolutely, it's in, it's incredible. Um, we actually was serving on the trolley before we closed uh, Baron Vigod stuff with um, truffle, which I know became a thing over Christmas as well, and that is the flavour of the truffle and then the mushroominess that you already have from the rind of the cheese was just... And how did you do that? Incredible. Were you cutting the cheese in half and putting truffle in like a truffle sandwich? Yeah, exactly. So we was making almost a cream cheese and truffle mix and then taking out the centre of, of Baron Bygod and then stuffing it with the mix of the truffle. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, that... <laughs> There's like really quality control checking it every morning i'm of not course. sure it needed it but somebody course, had to somebody, do it. it's a, somebody's got to do it Katie. but actually i know you're sort of joking there but actually with with these styles of cheeses you know where they are they need a bit of tlc don't they because what you don't want is them to be over and, and too ripe where actually they can sort of lose their their balance a little bit in terms of the flavor so i mean for you in the restaurants you have to kind of keep an eye on these cheeses and you know serve them when they're absolutely right not not too absolutely. young not too old i think that's a huge reason as to um why it's really beneficial to reduce the board to maybe not being sort of um 20 plus cheeses but having a few cheeses that you can really look after um i think that helps a lot and i think it helps us because catmel cheeses is if i walk out of the the back of Rogan and Co. It, it takes me maybe one minute to get there, so we don't have to take the cheeses in really huge quantities. Yeah, and it means that they they do the hard work really so of looking after them. them like you're, they're your cheese larder, basically. Exactly. And, yeah. Which well, I'm, is sure, great. I'm sure they're delighted to, <laughs> to to you know to to do that for you. I mean, that, a good cheesemonger, you know, that's where a good cheesemonger comes into their own. You know, I always say buy from a, a good indie retailer but, but particularly with these styles of cheeses they do need a bit of looking after um to get them just right um and that's where a, a good cheesemonger knows you know what temperature what humidity uh how to you know at what age is, is the right point to start selling them or you know not selling them that, that's the benefit isn't it working with a, a specialist i suppose 
Um, yeah. And well, let's move. Do you know? We should. I was in. Just before we move on, what what would you say? Would you do an accompaniment with this? A particular chutney or a? What would you recommend? Yeah. Well, we do a oat cake as one of the crackers um, at Long Plume and at Roven and Co now, and that's incredible with the the gooiness of of the cheese. With the oat cake, you you don't want a hard cheese, so Baron Bygod is beautiful for that, and. Um, We've always done a caramelised onion chutney, which works. I've got really. some I have some, actually, yeah. Oh, me too. Yeah, I've got some too. Like, I'm going to have it. So you would put that on with the... Let's try that with the... Yeah. The barrel. I'm going to try that. Because it's not... I often actually go with these sort of creamy, uh, bloomy rinded cheeses. I would normally... Often go with something with a bit of spice, actually. Yeah. Because uh, I think spice works quite well. But um, the sweetness and... I suppose onions have a kind of almost like a they have sort of a body to them don't they <laughs> onions which maybe i'm gonna get you know, i'll stop talking and just eat it that's probably the best thing <laughs> that's good onions yeah, have a I bit really of acidity like that's that's they have a bit of acidity so it is sweet but there's also acidity and that cuts through the creaminess mm. that's good Right, should we move on to the next one? I'm I'm getting into my stride now. I think we should, yeah. What what are we what are we gonna go for next? So the next one is um crop wheel, which is a lot easier for me to pick up actually. <laughs> um <laughs> and That's this beautiful. is made by Martin and Nicola Gott, and that they, they make this only about 10 minutes down the road from where I am now. Yeah. So not far away at all. And um this was my lockdown cheese so i know last year when the pandemic hit they stopped um, making st james and moved on to making crookville because they could obviously age it for longer and keep it for longer and james is um, a soft cheese isn't it and so it didn't have exactly. a very long shelf life yeah exactly yeah and um so they put a lot of attention into crookville which for me um, was <laughs> incredible. And in our household, we we consumed Crookville nearly every day, I think. <laughs> so this got you through lockdown, this cheese, did it? It really did. It, <laughs> it really did. So this is um, a sheet, this is, so like St. James. Oh, we've- uh, Sorry, I've lost you there. That's all right. So this is a sheep's milk cheese um, and he has his own flock of um, sheep, which is a lacoon variety, I believe, is that right? Yeah, who, which are the, the famous sheep of uh, Rockford. So the Lacoon breed of sheep is used. Their milk is ex used exclusively for, for Rockford um, cheese in the Aveyron region of south of France. But these sheep are, are, are out in the wilds of Cumbria. Um, yeah. He has his own. He has his own flock that he, um, you know, it's raw milk again. Is that right? It is. Yeah. And um, so, I mean. Hard sheep's milk cheeses, I mean, people immediately think of Manchego, don't they? Or maybe Pecorino. Peck, yeah, but it is, it's not too similar to either of those um, styles at all. It's a cheese that they'd been doing um, a little bit with the, the milk that they wasn't using for St. James. They'd uh, started to do Crookville. I probably tasted it maybe three years ago now uh, with Andy at the Courtyard Dairy, uh, but they put a lot into it last year obviously when they moved the production completely completely over and I really enjoy this one <laughs> the pa your passion for cheese is just I, I just love it it's coming through <laughs> if anyone wants to see a, a cheese geeks um Instagram feed in action check out Kaylee's because I mean it's virtually every post is you with a piece of cheese yeah talking sometimes about I Sometimes I think to myself, oh, maybe I should wait a few days to post this one because <laughs> no. I did only post a board yesterday. <laughs> share it, share it with the world. I mean, this is lovely. It's got, I'm not sure, do you know how old this is? How long he ages it for? I'm not 100% sure. So my one here is at about six months now. Yeah, that sounds, um, it feels like around that. You know, it's not, it's not massively old, but has some age on it, you know, so there's still... My piece still has some quite nice, you can sort of still taste the milk, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But there's, you're just starting to get some more of that nuttiness and spiciness and perhaps a yeah. little bit of, 
just at the finish, there's that little bit of sheepy, like l- lanoliny, but I mean, in a nice way. It's a sort of sweet, animally flavour, which is delicious. Or umami, I suppose, at the end. Yeah, it's it's really good. I, I mean, I've tasted it um, when it's only about three months old and it's it's quite a bit more lactic and um, maybe a little bit more farmy, if that's the right word, which... Yeah. It's earthy and, and, and a yeah. bit more of the it's actually changes nearer the rind as well. It's 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 more sort of spicy and animally near the rind. And actually the center, so this bit here to me, when I was tasting my slice, which came from the top there, it had a bit more sort of spicy, um was a bit more intense, I suppose. And in here, on this sort of uh, section of the, the slice that it was a bit more sort of sweet and caramel and um, really nice mix, actually, um, sort of balanced together really nicely. Um, good cheese. Yeah. So is this, sa- this is good. when you reopen the restaurants. Will this be on the on the board? I think sadly, um, the last time I I caught up with the guys over at um, at Holker, I think they they won't be focusing too much on um, Crookville production this year so they're going to do a lot of um St James and they've um recently got some goats during the pandemic uh last year in the first lockdown uh, so I think they'll be focusing quite a bit um on that but I'm certain that we'll be having some of those cheeses yeah uh, on the board but I had to take a little bit left of a of crook wheel while while, stocks while we could yeah I mean it's, it's an interesting one that so you know what Martin did and it just shows how good British cheesemakers are now because you know he was making a soft cheese the lockdown struck a lot of restaurants closed well all the restaurants closed in the first one and so he switched to making well putting more of his milk into harder aging cheeses like Crookwheel just so that it gave him a bit more time you know St James you have a, a, a you know a matter of weeks to sell it but with Crookwheel you've got months so it just kind of a way of storing the milk, I suppose, during that sort of crisis point, which thankfully we're coming out of now. Um, Absolutely. So good that he's going back to soft cheese. I mean, that's a really healthy sign. It shows like, okay, things are getting back to normal. Oh, there we go. Um, Let's move on uh, to the last cheese. I'll just finish that bit of cook, Will. I just had that with a piece of pickled walnut, um, which... uh, are wonderfully quirky accompaniments. Really nice because it has acidity, some spice, and it's quite nutty. And I'd say that cheese is, has some nutty. Yeah. Well. Um, let's try the last cheese. We're going blue. So what have we yes. got here? I've got quite a, uh, a big slice of, of this oh, one. Look, you're showing off now. Look, look at that. <laughs> oh, I, I, <laughs> I feel a bit inadequate. Although mine is quite, look at that. Yeah, mine, oh, mine is oh, a, oh, you see. a sliver. <laughs> Um, so what have we got here, Katie? Um, so this is Lanark Blue, um, which is made up at uh, Errington Farm by the Errington family. So originally Humphrey and now his daughter Selena has taken over up there. Um, this is one of the first sort of farmhouse blues that I that I tasted, actually. And uh, it's actually made with the uh, with sheep's milk from the same sheep that are made to use uh, St. James, or oh, St. James, sorry. Yeah. Maybe not the same sheep, the same breed. The same yeah. breed, yes, yeah, so it's that same lacoon uh, breed that I was yeah. going on about with Rockford. Yeah, I'm oh, interesting. So so is this sort of Scotland's answer to Rockford then? It's a, a I, blue I would definitely sheep's say, milk cheese. I wouldn't want to say um, on here that it's better. But <laughs> it's I actually, mean... it's, quite, it's quite different actually to Rockford. It's, it's, it's not as... It's not as salty and spicy as Rockford, and it's more um, the, the texture is is less um, less crumbly, I suppose. Um, yeah, but it does yeah, have it's that quite lovely, smooth, isn't it? Yeah. It's held together quite quite well. But oh, that's a beauty! Oh, so good. And that's, I mean, I suppose actually where you are in Cumbria, you're not actually that far from Scotland are you I mean it's actually quite a local cheese for you it is and um before we went into the lockdown uh, one thing that I decided to when 
creating the cheese board at Rogan and Co is we changed it a little bit so as I said before we've always normally worked on different styles and of cheese into the four um four different styles that I explained and when I come to Rogan and Co something that I've always really wanted to do was um do a board from one maker at any one time and uh, really be able to give support to that maker for the space of maybe one or three months um so Errington was the first the first one and the only one so far that we had chance to do that with but we was taking Elric Log, which is a what Ashwash Rind goat's cheese from them and then Coralin which is um an aged sheep's milk and then Lanark Blue and we was doing those three cheeses on the board and then really being able to give our guests the information um about the about the cheeses and a huge thing is that uh, they're made in such a sustainable way, which really fits in with our ethos in the restaurants here. So I was a, working quite closely with these guys. That's a brilliant. So the entire cheese board was one cheese maker, basically. So you're really showcasing their full range and the skills that they've got and different milk types and stuff as well. That's that's a genius idea. So that's coming back. Uh, Rogan and Co's not open yet. Will it be opening in May? Is that right? Rogan and Co will open on the seventeenth of May, the same as Long Clume. The only restaurant that's open at the moment is um, Penrock, which is up in Bowness. Yeah. So, so and so, will you you'll stick with that idea in Rogan and Co of doing the, you know, showcasing yeah, a particular producer? Exactly. Yeah. It, actually, just after this call, um, um, I'll be speaking to. Uh, Tom and Simon up here to discuss which cheeses we'll be putting on but we will be sticking to the same ethos of supporting one maker for a few months and hopefully being able to to make a little bit of, of a difference there especially over this last year I think it's just something that's been so important um yeah oh that's I, I love that it allows you to go really deep into one cheese maker's sort of full range and as, as a as a diner I would love to, you know that would make me want to walk yeah. the cheese board actually um, so I, I just I, I've got mine on it, it's I've got mine on a little uh, a, a little sourdough cracker from Peter's Yard. This is the fig and spelt one, and I think the fig their fig uh, crackers work really well with blue cheese. I use them a lot with blue cheese. There's something about the fig. The fig is a quite a good accompaniment for blue cheese generally, isn't it? Yeah, um, absolutely. But the flavour of of the cheese is quite sort of it's so almost like a yeasty quality. It's got or, or, or even biscuity. Like it's in that. So, yeah, I think the biscuity like is definitely on the rind. You really, almost mm. like a digestive like um like note to it. That's it. It is. You're right. Like a digestive biscuit. Like that sort of malty, biscuity, slightly yeasty. It's lovely. And I, I mean, it's interesting you've gone with two sheep's milk cheeses because they're amongst my absolute favourites. Behind. they are mine they've, they've got a sort of just a sweetness about them it's not overpowering but just a lovely delicate sweetness um and i get that both from the crook wheel and the, the lanark blue beautiful well kaylee we've come we could go on for about another hour i think I quite easily couldn't we um yeah i'm gonna put i'm gonna put my piece of cheese down that and just say thank you very much it's been brilliant oh, it's really no amazing. thank you so much for having us and um thank you so much for you know taking part in the weekend and and taking us deep into uh you know what makes an, a brilliant cheese board so really appreciate it and and all the best with reopening i hope i hope you're <laughs> booked up for months and months to come absolutely yeah we are we are it's going, going to be a busy summer so we're really looking forward to it well good luck and you know brilliant keep supporting british cheese and you know good luck absolutely. with everything when you reopen Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Cheers.